Hello everyone, welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith, and today we dive into gameplay for Resident Evil the board game from Steam Forge Games. If you haven't checked out my unboxing video, which showed you everything that came inside the Kickstarter edition of Resident Evil, you'll want to check that out to see everything because not everything may be used during the gameplay. Also want to make mention of the fact that I've already done a setup video as well to show you how to set up for the campaign play we're about to dive into right now. Both of those videos you'll see in the top right hand corner. You can check those out. Come back here, and we're about to dive into gameplay right now. Let's first go over the introduction for the scenario that we've chosen in the mansion. We're also going to go over the objectives we're trying to complete. We'll talk about win and loss conditions. We'll dive right into gameplay. There is one tweak to the setup that I need to make, and we'll make that mention right now. The one correction from the setup video I need to make, and it's not a major one, but it is certainly something you don't want to miss. This door right here in this scenario is considered a locked door, the one facing towards the camera. We need the sword key in order to enter it, and to denote this, we're going to place this card underneath. And that's the only correction from the setup video. You'll see the card placed underneath the door now, denoting that it's locked, and we need the sword key to open it. Also, I've placed a number of commonly used tokens in a game tray. The game tray does not come as part of this particular game, but is very handy for storing tokens while using them in gameplay. Now let's read the flavor text for First Floor East A. A brisk chill has taken root in this area, chasing down the long corridors through windows that have been smashed in from outside. As if the sight weren't disturbing enough, you detect traces of dried blood on the jagged glass and floor beneath, only slowly washing away with the patter of rain from outside. Despite your sense of trepidation, you can't turn back. Doubtless, you'll find important clues if you explore, and possibly even another way out of the mansion. You'll just have to hope whatever came in through the windows doesn't find you first. The objectives for this scenario state that the characters must find an important item in order to progress. It says if the item C card for this scenario has been collected and each character is on the same tile, the players can choose to successfully complete the scenario at any time. If there are any enemies on the same tile as the characters when the scenario is completed, you skip step 6 during the end phase. Let's find out what that step you'd be skipping is. Now just to tie in that rule around skipping step six, here is the end phase details found in the advanced rules at the back of the rule book. You'll find two columns of information to follow when you complete a scenario, or if you fail the scenario, you'll follow the steps. The step six is talking about actually skipping is in the completed side. If you complete the scenario, but there is enemies on the tile that you've completed the scenario on, you're gonna skip healing each player's character by one level. Characters can then use medical items normally in their inventories to heal by the printed amount, but you won't be able to do anything within six. So it's in your best interest to ensure the tile you're on when you complete the scenario is completely free of enemies. So now we understand our objective. The next thing we need to understand is our enemy. We want to take a look through the scenario setup and see which enemies are visible and known from the very beginning. Well, we know we have a zombie in play. So we're going to take the zombie reference card and place it nearby. You can easily have this off camera or off to the side in your case, but I choose to place it dead center so I can always reference it as I need to. It'll tell you health and it'll also tell you movement, a number of other major stats for the particular enemy. Also, any special abilities it might have. The zombies here have tough hide. So if the enemy is killed, you replace it with a corpse. Corpse. That ties right into the corpse we've already seen over here. I'll show you how those interact with me as I move through the scenario later on. And also it has its basic attack as well as if it does have a special attack, it'll have that listed with a little tiny circle to the side of the row. So this one does have a special attack. I'll show you how those actually trigger when we get into gameplay in just a moment. Now let's talk about how you can lose the game and the scenario. One of the ways is if the tension deck, which is in the top left hand corner, completely is empty. In other words, there's no cards there whatsoever to draw from and you need to draw a card, then the scenario is a failure. Now let's talk about how characters can impact the success of a scenario. The players, or the player in my case, I cannot successfully complete a scenario if one or more of the characters I'm controlling are unconscious. So we have to go over to an unconscious character and resuscitate them. We can use things like a first aid spray in order to bring them back. It's worth noting, say for instance, Jill had her fine status for health, which is the best she can be at, go down to danger and then take one more hit past it. That would put her in an unconscious state. 
her mini would actually tip over. It would take up the same amount of space on the actual game board and bosses and other enemies would ignore it for all intents and purposes. That character is downed and unconscious, but the other character that's still alive would be working really hard to try to get over to Jill, either in the same space or an adjacent one to use something like a first aid spray to bring Jill back. Also, you can do a trade action as the other character with a unconscious character in order to maybe grab an item out of their inventory that you can use to help them, like the first aid spray. Say for instance, Rebecca didn't have any left, Jill was unconscious and Jill had a first aid spray. I could go up to Jill, take it out of her inventory and then use it on her to bring her back. When she comes back from being down in an unconscious state, she's gonna come back at the caution level for health. So to summarize how you can lose a scenario based on this situation, if an unconscious character cannot be resuscitated because none of the characters have a first aid spray or there are none left in the item B deck, the players fail the scenario. Now we've talked about ways in which you can fail a scenario, but there's a much worse situation, losing the whole campaign. And this happens all based on the danger level dial. And you'll see it starts with an S, which is the starting position. You lose the entire campaign if that danger level dial rotates all the way through all danger levels, all the way back to the S again. When it hits the S again, you have into the end of the current scenario to try and reduce it. And if you can't do it, you lose the campaign. You gotta start all over again. The mansion in this case has been overrun by enemies and there is nowhere left to hide. You want to avoid this at all costs. Managing the danger level dial is a big deal during the campaign. We're now ready to begin gameplay and we start off in the actions phase where we're going to have our characters taking their turns going in clockwise order. So we'll start on the left with Rebecca Chambers and then we're going to head over to Jill Valentine to round out the actions phase. We then will move into the reaction phase and after that we head into the tension phase. Inside the same room as Rebecca is a very important piece of terrain. It is the item box, and this is a box that you can spend an action in order to interact with it, whether you're beside it, adjacent to it, or in the same space. It's considered a medium-sized object, so two other small bases can be in there as well, but essentially allows you to move any items, any number of items, from your inventory into the item box, or vice versa, taking items out of the inventory box. Again, if you play the video game, you'll be familiar with this. Basically, these items that will go into the box will end up on the campaign dashboard. Here's a location on the dashboard for those items. So as we place items in the box, this is where they'll go. And when we want to pull things out, we'll take them from this area. At this point, I'm happy keeping everything in hand. On a character's activation, I can perform up to four actions and I can do the same action multiple times if I'm able to accomplish it. I can move, attack, I can open and close doors and you'll see how closing doors can be very helpful later on. You can search, you can trade, you can use an item that you have. There's a number of things that you can do within each of these as well. Now in terms of movement, which is the first thing I wanna do, the fact that I will not be bothering to head towards this item box and also there's a dividing red wall you can see there. The walls in this game are all outlined in red so you can easily tell where you can traverse. So in other words, if we're here in this location, I can't jump over into this area. I have to go through a door. So we have doors linking our way through here like a snake. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna move. You'll notice also this wall crosses into the middle of this tile, which means from where I'm standing currently, although you can do diagonal movement in this game, I cannot hop from this location into this location in this situation because the wall is blocking it. I have to have a clear path through. So we're gonna go take the long way around. We're gonna go one, two, and I'm going to crack the door for three. So Rebecca has used two actions to move to the door. One action to crack open the door has one more action left, looking into the next room, feeling like something is off. We have to make a strategic decision here. We have an unexplored token sitting in the next tile area, the next room essentially. If we cross through that door right now with our final move action, which would be a total of four, and that would be all the actions that Rebecca has, we have to resolve this unexplored token, drawing two cards off the top of the exploration deck, and who knows what will come after us in that situation. Now we won't have any actions to do anything or to mitigate anything. We'll be in potentially a really bad situation, maybe. So the question here is, do we bother going through the door? I'm gonna say no in this situation and on your character's turn, you can choose to skip actions. You can choose to skip your entirety of your turn if you wish. You're of course just wasting time in this case and that's why the tension deck is there to slowly continually keep you moving, but there will be times it does not make strategic sense to move yourself in. Another thing to note is you'll see an icon here in this room. If I move into that space and one of those cards happens to spawn something, it's going to land in the same location that Rebecca is standing in. So you're gonna to wanna to keep an eye out for those white icons because you really don't want to try and end your turn on those. 
Now, another key aspect of Resident Evil is anytime you crack a door in the game, you're going to always want to see on the connecting tile any other doors, whether they're open or closed. Take a look and see how many other tiles are connected via an open path. Now, in this situation, even though we cracked this door, this one right here is closed. So we're good. During the reaction phase, this zombie will not be coming towards me because it's not going to move through a closed door. However, if this door had been open, cracking this door open would connect multiple tiles together meaning during the reaction phase that zombie is going to be heading our way. And now you're going to see why what I just mentioned is so important. We're now done Rebecca's action phase. We move into her reaction phase where we take a look at the tile she's currently on, which is this room right here, and any connecting tile that has an open archway or doorway. So there's two tiles currently that are active based on her reaction phase, but neither of them have any enemies inside of it, so nothing happening. Rebecca's reaction phase is all done. We'll talk more about how the reaction phase has even more excitement inside of it when things line up for the enemies in the future. There's also out of sequence reactions. That's another whole ball of wax that can be fun and throw all kinds of wrenches at you. Again, I'll talk about those when we hit them. For now, we move from the reaction phase to the tension phase, draw the top card off the deck, and we got a middle tier difficulty card. This is a yellowish orange card called Frayed Nerves. Now, if you get green ones, that's what you want to see. Those ones have flavor text, but nothing nasty coming at you. These middle tier ones, you don't really want to see them, but they're not as bad. But the red ones, you're going to learn to really despise those ones. Frayed Nerves tells us movement chases through the shadows, enemies all around you. If the next character, which is Jill, is on the same tile at the start of their tension phase as they began their turn on, they must draw two additional tension cards. That is not good. Now, something else that's not good and worth keeping an eye on is your danger dial. As I mentioned, it's a way you can lose a campaign. If this thing cycles all the way around and increments up until it hits the S again, in other words, a full rotation, and you can't reduce it inside the scenario you're currently in, the campaign is lost. So what happens as the danger dial is increasing over the course of the campaign, when you see these icons on those tension cards, you're going to add whatever effects match the current danger level of your dial into the pile of fun you have to deal with. So you'd be reading not only this area here, but if our danger dial was up to this category of danger, then we'd also be, after resolving this card, removing it from the game. Now this one doesn't sound like it's all that terrible, but believe me, some of the things that'll get thrown at you with the red cards and some of these other yellowish orange cards, really nasty. So you're gonna want to keep that danger level dial in check. Rebecca's activation is complete. You've now seen from start to finish how a character is activated. Of course, there's nuances and changes that can potentially happen based on timing and game effects. Maybe we'll see some of that stuff change in how Jill's turn pans out. Speaking of Jill's turn, we're starting hers right now. She comes in with the frayed nerves already because this card is going to affect her. It states, as we read moments ago, if the next character, which is Jill in this case, is on the same tile at the start of their tension phase, as they began their turn on, they must draw two additional additional cards in the tension phase. So we'd be drawing a total of three, which is not good. So we want to get ourselves off of this tile. The tile ends right here. It's just a six square tile. So we really just need to get through this archway, past the corpse and into this area, or we could go through this door into the long corridor. Either way, that would help us to avoid the frayed nerves. Now, just before I make my decision as to which way I want to head to get off this tile to avoid the frayed nerves, let's talk about corpses because there is a corpse right in front of a doorway. So if I move into a space with a corpse, then I immediately need to roll a D6. If I land this icon right here, which represents the six, then that corpse turns into a zombie. That zombie basically stands up just like you've seen in the Resident Evil video games and is coming after me. And it's nasty because it's in the same spot as me. So again, that could really slow me down in getting the number of actions I need to get into into the next room, hence the risk there. So to avoid that risk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move once, twice, crack the door, and we're going to go through. And that will trigger this right here. We'll have to draw two cards from the top of the encounter deck, but at least we know for sure we'll be here, avoiding the frayed nerves, and we're also not on top of any type of spawn, because check this out, that wouldn't be good either. This is a much better one to go into for frayed nerves currently. So Jill uses all four of her actions, two to move, one to open the door, and another to move. She gets into the next tile. The second she lands on that new tile, she needs to go ahead and draw two encounter cards. The first card states, locate the closest tile to the active character that contains one or more enemies and at least one non-locked closed door. Open every non-locked closed door on that tile. 
The closest tile to the active character, which is Jill, is quite a ways away up here with a zombie inside of it. There are two non-locked doors here. Both of these are going to open up. The two doors swing open because of the shambling zombie in the zone, banging into both those doors and swinging them open. The one here on the right, which leads to currently nothing, because we have not stepped through that door to explore it yet, will remain completely open, but nothing will be going in or out of it until an actual character we control does, and then we'll be able to explore into that tile and see what's there. But the one that does have an impact is this one here, which opens up. That now leads a direct connection back to Rebecca, which is certainly going to impact her turn in the future. Now onto our second encounter card and this time we find ourselves a corpse. So the corpse is spawned and it's always spawned closest to the active character in this case this spawn zone here rather than this one. If there had been two corpses being spawned one would be placed here the other placed here. You always divide up the enemies that are coming in across the spawn points. That'll resolve Jill's player phase. She's used all four of her actions and also dealt with the encounter cards and resolve those. We now move to the reaction phase. There's no zombies or any enemies present that are actually going to activate. Corpses are lying dormant for now. So we're good and we're safe. We now move to the tension phase and thankfully the frayed nerves will not apply as we ensured ourselves not on the tile we started on with Jill. And Jill gets lucky in her tension phase and all clear. Here's what the green cards look like. You want to see these. It states you pause, ears strained for even the slightest sound. Nothing beyond your own ragged breathing. So does this mean that you're safe for now? Probably not. And we're heading now into Rebecca Chambers' turn. Let's go ahead and take a closer look at Rebecca's actual character card. We'll see some of the abilities that she has she can use as well as the things in her inventory. When you take a look at one of the main characters in the game, in the top right hand corner, you'll see three icons. The very first one is for their evade roll. When an evade roll is done, it'll tell you how many dice that character rolls. So it's two for Rebecca. For Jill, it's also two. Inventory limit for Rebecca is six. And inventory limit for Jill, who's off screen, is eight. And then up here in the very top right, we have the number of kerosene tokens, which we saw during setup. We got a maximum of four, and we have all four of those above. We again have an inventory laid out based on our starting items so two first aid sprays and a handgun of course first aid spray going to help us with our health Taking a closer look at the abilities on Rebecca's card, we have Field Medic. It says once per turn, Rebecca can use a Medic item. So that would be the items you can see in the top left without spending an action. So that's pretty handy. And then Specialist Training says when Rebecca uses a Medical item, you heal the character an additional level. Here's a close look at what Jill has on her character card. We talked about stuff in the top right hand corner of her card already, but her special abilities are a bit different. She has Master of Unlocking, a very cool ability. Jill can unlock a door if another character has the required key in their inventory. So she can make use of that at a different location than the character who's holding the actual key. Pretty cool. This one here says Fighting Spirit. So when an encounter card with the star symbol is drawn, Jill and each other character on her tile heals one level. So that's also going to be really beneficial. We have a knife here with Jill. We don't have a knife with Rebecca, so that's good for close encounters. But a knife is also not silent. All the weapons in this game are going to make some type of noise when you are using them. So you have to keep that in mind as you play through the game. Sometimes not using a weapon is a good option. It's time for Rebecca to activate. We're going to go ahead and walk through the door for one action. Rebecca heads into the unexplored room, and when she does, she has to reveal two encounter cards. This encounter card is a special one, as it has the star icon on it. It says, after resolving all spawn entries on cards drawn with this card, replace the closest corpse with a zombie. So to find out if we're spawning anything else, we'll draw the next encounter card. We have another special one here. It says to locate the closest tile to the active character that contains one or more enemies and at least one non-locked closed door. Open every non-locked closed door on the tile. This is happening quite a bit. Now there's a rule around encounter cards where if you can complete a portion of it, you go ahead and do so. But if you can't complete any of it, and this is one of those cases, then you're going to go ahead and draw an additional card. We cannot do this because we already have the enemy which is located nearest to our character. There's only one enemy in the game currently, and that's really our constraint here. But these doors have already been cracked open, so this particular encounter card doesn't add or change anything to the situation. So we're drawing another one. This one absolutely will. It says we're going to be spawning a corpse, and we're 
we're spawning it in the area where the active character is, and unfortunately, it's going to be right where Rebecca is standing. Now, it also states down below, it says, at the end of the active character's tension phase, replace each corpse on this tile with a zombie. Now we head back to that very first encounter card we got, which stated, after resolving all spawn entries on cards drawn with this card, replace the closest corpse with a zombie. So guess what? That corpse has showed up in our space. It's a zombie. It stands up and it's coming after us. So this is very unfortunate for Rebecca. She goes through a door, stumbles over a corpse, and now she's got a zombie in her space. And as we know from previous entries in the Resident Evil series, and nothing changes here, if we try to do any action other than attack, we're going to have to go ahead and do an evade to try to see if we can succeed in order to continue with that action, or we can just choose to attack. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. So in making an attack, we choose an enemy to target. We're going to choose the zombie in our space. We're going to go ahead and spend ammunition based on what we want to do here. I'm using the handgun it costs one bullet in order to roll one blue die to try and take this thing down. We'll talk about the icons and how things resolve in a second, but I'll tell you right now, I want to up my odds. I'm going to use the rapid fire ability here of this handgun at the very bottom. The icon for rapid fire means I can spend an extra bullet one more time. So two bullets in order to get two blue dice or even three bullets for three dice. I'm going all the way with three. So our ammunition dial drops down to 12. We'll also grab the three blue dice and you're gonna see the actual results here across the top and what will happen. There are certain things that are going to occur dependent on the roll that we get. So for instance here, if we happen to land this right here, it's basically kind of like grazing the enemy as if we shot it and kind of hit its shoulder and just made it stumble back. It'll allow us to push the enemy to an adjacent square, which can be beneficial getting it, getting it off of us at least. But then we also have this result right here, which is the one we really want to see. That's going to inflict one damage, and that's all we need in order to take down the zombie on the zombie's character card. It shows one health is all it has. So we're aiming to get this right here. Of course, if we get any of these other ones with arrows, none of those are going to be beneficial. And you'll see kind of the best result on the handgun actually doesn't give us any result whatsoever, but on higher powered weapons, that will certainly be a good thing. So let's go ahead, roll the dice and see how we do. Hoping with three dice, we can make this happen. Oh, we did get a graze though, so we were able to pull off at least a push. Grazing the enemy is considered a successful attack. We're able to push the enemy into an adjacent space of our choosing, and there's definitely one I'm eyeing in the back right corner. So Rebecca is successful at least hitting the zombie and creating space. Not able to take it down just yet, but we've got options here. We have two more actions, but something now triggers based on what we decided to do. It's called an out of sequence reaction. My attack wasn't quiet and any enemies that were not the target of the attack that are on the same tile or any linked tiles are going to make an out of sequence reaction. In this case, that's going to have the zombie in the corridor there turn around and head towards the door. So as you can see, out of sequence reactions are going to be something that will always be impacting your strategy as you go along. Now, if the zombie happens to be in the same space as me, it would have made an attack rather than move. But as of right now, it's out of sequence reaction is simply to move towards the noise that it's hearing. Now on the topic of out of sequence reactions, there's three ways those out of sequence reactions can occur. The first one is making an attack like you just saw now. So zombies that are on the same tile or link tiles that were not targeted are going to start moving towards you. Not good. The other one is making an action in the same square as an enemy that is not an attack action. If you choose some other action, the enemy performs an attack against you. As I mentioned prior, if the evade roll fails, the action's not resolved, but still counts as having being spent. And the third way an out of sequence reaction can occur is attacking an enemy in the same square. If the attack is not successful, the character is automatically hit by the target's basic attack. And this could have actually happened when I made an attack moments ago on the top right zombie. It was in my square, and if I had a failed at that attack and I was luckily able to graze it and push it away, it would have hit me. I've got two more actions to spend with Rebecca. Very tempted to potentially get in there, get the item and head south. But of course we got zombies all around us and we don't really want to be close by to any zombie within one square because during the reaction phase, that zombie is gonna be able to get into our space. And again, that's gonna slow us down and potentially lead to maybe some hits from out of sequence reactions of us trying to fight it off. So I'm gonna do one more attempt at trying to kill off the zombie in the top right hand corner and down it. So in order to do that, I have to use at least one bullet. I'm gonna 
use three bullets. We're going to use our rapid fire again. I'm going to go a little crazy here. We'll see if we get the hit we need. We're looking for that one hit that looks like a bullet hole. That is going to be the one we're aiming for here. What did we get? We got it. We luckily got it. It actually rolled just off screen, but we were able to do it. That's enough to down the zombie. Now these zombies are tough, and as it mentions right on the zombie card itself, tough hide. If this enemy is killed, replace it with a corpse. So a corpse goes in that position. Good news for me, it's nowhere near me, so nothing to worry about, and I'm not going to walk into that space and have to roll a d6 because I do not want to entertain that. Now it's worth mentioning if the corpse had a showed up in the same space. So say for instance the enemy was in my space and I took it down and it turned into a corpse, you do not have to roll the d6 in those situations. Only if you move back into the space would you have to roll it. At least at this point things are clear i've got one more move action but first we do have to do an out of sequence reaction because this zombie just heard me attack again so it's coming through the door so with Rebecca's final action, she runs up to the item. She's not able to take it because she's used her four actions. The out-of-sequence reaction also occurred. Zombie came through the door. That's going to do it for our player turn. We're now going to go into the reaction phase. And yes, we do have a zombie that is going to be making a reaction. So as you can clearly see, out-of-sequence reactions on top of the reaction phase can really get the zombies moving. So one is already coming down on us pretty fast. We're now going to move into the tension phase. And we also have to keep in mind we have this card, which isn't going to be an issue right now until we get to the end of this character's or the active character's tension phase. So let's go ahead and draw our tension card, see where we land. We got lucky this time with an all clear. It states in the card, in times to come, this evening will define you. How you overcame the challenges, how you defeated your enemies, how you triumphed and solved this mystery. Don't let this beat you. You must survive. Now at this point, we are done the tension phase. And when we're done it, it tells us here we're going to replace each corpse on the tile we're on with a zombie. So unfortunately, the one we just down to the right of us is popping right back up again. So as you can see, the choices you make in combat will have a ripple effect across the gameplay at all times. Now I'm going to shift my focus over to Jill's turn. A very different situation over here. Lots of corpses, but no zombies to deal with. We're going to go ahead and head back into the tile we came from. We were able to avoid the frayed nerves card, thankfully. So we'll get Jill back into the area here, and we're going to actually move into the space with the corpse. Jill uses two actions, moves into the space with the corpse. I need to make one correction, but I mentioned it on screen earlier. It's actually not a six that the Umbrella Corporation icon replaces. There is a six on the die. That was a slip of the tongue on my part. It's actually the one that it replaces. So if we land the one, this corpse will reanimate. We do not want to see that happen. Let's go ahead and roll the die, see what we get. We got ourselves a six, so we are a-okay. I'm going to be a little bit gutsy and quite a bit risky here with the third action. We're going to move into the next tile. The second we do this, we have to go ahead and resolve the unexplored token. The bad news here is I am standing in a space with a spawn, so that might not be a good move on my part, but we're going to push ourselves forward here. Yeah, no, that was definitely a bad idea. We got ourselves a Cerberus here showing up in the same space we're standing. This is super unfortunate. I absolutely should have held off and stayed where I was. We have another spawn, another zombie showing up in the active character square. Things just escalated really, really quickly. Well, I've gotten Jill into quite the situation here. We've got two enemies. Both of their character cards are on the table. I'll give you a close-up of the Cerberus in just a moment, but I'm definitely going to go ahead and make an attack here for my fourth action and see whether I can at least thin the herd a little bit. We're going to use rapid fire on the pistol, so three bullets bring us from 15 down to 12. So you'll see on the character cards for both the enemies in play now, the zombie and the Cerberus, they both have one health each. So my attack here could take out either one of them. I do have to pick a target though. Taking a look at the Cerberus here, the Feral ability says, if the top card in the tension deck discard pile matches that particular icon, which kind of looks like an orange cut in half, this enemy performs two reactions instead of one during the reaction phase. Well, that reaction phase is coming up in the future and I don't want that to happen. So this is going to be the target of my attack. That is what you call an absolutely brutal set of encounter cards that came out. We're going to go ahead and make our roll with three blue dice. We're hoping for good things here. I got to thin this a little bit just to make life easier later on. Let's see how we do. Come on, give me that hit. No, we do not get a single hit across any of the dice. So unfortunately for Jill, her fourth action, which was an attack against the Cerberus, was unsuccessful. The Cerberus gets to do a basic attack, which is a one damage attack against Jill, dropping her from fine closer to caution. 
Things really aren't looking too great for Jill, and I'm not too excited to go into the reaction phase right now. Now, a couple things here around edit sequence reactions. I was attacking an enemy inside my square. I took the damage because I missed. I take a basic attack from the enemy. The second I do this, I can choose to push that enemy, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to push the Cerberus off to the bottom right-hand corner of this tile, and also, if any other enemies were present on the tile or connecting linked tiles, they would also be able to move towards me at this point, but there isn't any. The ones that are already in my space are just happy to be there. So even though Jill was unsuccessful in attacking the Cerberus in her space, she was able to push it after it went ahead and bit her. We now move into the reaction phase for Jill's turn. Jill's the active character, and on her tile and link tiles, she does have two enemies to contend with. Those two enemies' cards are right here. The highest threat level is the one to focus on to start, so that'll be Cerberus here. Now, the thing to note is it will do a basic attack if it can. It is also going to try and do its special attack if it can. It will do its special attack instead of its basic attack if this symbol, which is very small, it's just an X symbol, symbol is in the bottom of the last tension deck card. So the last all clear card that we got had an X at the bottom, which does match the special icon down here for Cerberus, which means Cerberus has a range of three. So even though it's been pushed back one, it still is within range to do damage to her and it's going to do a special attack. So I've got a special attack coming from Cerberus, which is not going to be fun at range 3. It will sit right there. It will go ahead and try to do one damage to me. I do get to roll evade dice, and it's worth mentioning, when you're rolling these dice, you're now going to take a look around to see if any other enemies are within range to make an attack. And if they are, they're also going to contribute their bases into the evade roll. So we do have two small bases in this equation. And based on a chart at the back of the rulebook, it'll tell you if you have a small base, then any of the three arrow icons that can show up on the dice will result in a success. So if you happen to see any of these three, you are in good standing. If you happen to have a medium base or two small bases when you make your evade roll, then you're only going to be successful if you land these two symbols on the blue dice. And if you have a medium base and small base or three small bases, you're only successful if you land this symbol on one one of the evade dice as you roll. So long story short, if multiple enemies are in range to attack the character when you're making your highest threat level attack, those enemies just contribute to making your evade roll that much more tough. They will not then go ahead and actually attack you as well. So the zombie here is going to make my roll more difficult, meaning I have to roll one of these two die results when I roll my two evade dice. And again, I'm getting two evade dice because that's what's on Rebecca. Chamber's character card. We're going to roll these and hope for one of those two results, but the zombie won't attack afterwards. So it's kind of everyone just dogpiling in at the same time. Let's see if we can evade this attack from the Cerberus. Can we pull it off? We do. It was awesome to see Jill be able to avoid that attack. We're done the reaction phase. We now move to the tension phase. Looks like things are still on our side here. We have an all clear. It states you can hear trees rustle outside, swaying on the wind. The longest of their branches tickle the window panes, scratching like nails. Lightning flashes and a long shadow stretches over the floor. Suddenly, you're not sure the sound belongs to trees after all. So at this point, you've seen the game flow through a number of turns throughout the different characters I'm controlling. We're going to pick up the pace at this point and start doing turns without as much explanations, unless, of course, something new comes into the fray. So without further ado, let's go ahead and have Rebecca activate next. She's going to pick up the item in her square. Rebecca searches her space and finds a green herb. It states on it, heal this character or another character in the same or an adjacent square by one level. We're not going to use it right now. Next, instead of focusing on attacking, we're going to try and run away. So we're going to go ahead and do a movement here. Another movement getting into the same space as a zombie. For my fourth action with Rebecca, we're going to go ahead and try and get past this zombie. We're going to do a move while there's a zombie in the space. When we do this, we're taking a basic attack from the enemy, so we get to evade. We're going to go ahead and roll our evasion here. Two dice. We can get any of the arrows, and we successfully evade. Otherwise, we're taking a hit. Hopefully that doesn't happen. Yes, we successfully evaded it, so we're able to run past. So Rebecca is making a break for the door. It's not really a far distance away from the zombie, just moving one away. So now we're going to move into the reaction phase. And of course, we know how this is going to go. 
The zombies on the same tile as Rebecca and connecting or linked tiles are going to move towards Rebecca. So the zombie we just evaded is back in her square and the other one has moved diagonally to head towards her as well. We're lucky enough to get a green all-clear card here. It says, are the footsteps you hear at the edge of your earshot another survivor, or do they belong to something else entirely? Regardless, one thing is clear. If you can hear them, they can hear you too. In this situation, Jill is going to attempt to move out of the square with the zombie inside of it, so she's going to try and attempt to evade. Here's hoping that is going to be successful. So we're going ahead and rolling two evasion dice, thanks to that evasion stat on her character card, stating two. Let's see if we get at least one of the arrows, because that's all we need for one small base in our square. And we got nothing. So that, unfortunately, is a failed evasion. So when I tried to move, not only do I burn the action, I'm also taking another hit on Jill. So Jill is now moving to the caution area of her health tracker, but the thing we get now is a chance to push an enemy away. So Jill's going to go ahead and push the zombie in her space away, as I can do this once I've taken a hit. So taking a look at where I can push, I cannot push diagonally because the wall is blocking that movement. So the best I can do is push off to the side like this. At this point now, I'm going to use the rest of my actions to get as far away from these enemies and give myself some distance. So I use my final three actions to move all the way to the back of that area where the B item token is. I don't have any more actions. And also, if you're wondering if I could have moved diagonally, I cannot because, as you can see, there is a wall right on the corner. So I cannot use a diagonal movement from here to here. I have to take the long way around. We now head into the reaction phase. We take a look at the bottom of the last tension card and currently it has no symbol on it, which is a good thing. That means no special attacks will be used from the enemies. At this point, they're pretty far away from me anyway, which is great news. Their basic attack for the server still needs a range of zero, so it needs to get up close and personal. Its move value is two, so it is going to move around the wall, taking the long way one and two into that back corner right here. And the zombie's just gonna move one space. So our enemies are starting to back us into a corner. Hopefully the item B will be worth it, but we'll be able to fight our way out, I hope. Not good, not good at all. We got ourselves another mid-tier tension card. We do not want to see this. This one says, Bloody hands push at the windows and doors. A horde of foes waiting in ambush. If this character leaves their current tile during their next turn, they must draw two extra cards in the next tension phase. Actually, honestly, of any time to get this card, this is the perfect time because we're going to be in here fighting probably for the majority of the next turn. We're back over to this section of the mansion with Rebecca activating. We're going to go ahead and try and evade again. I'm going to try to get separation away from the zombie that's in my square. Hopefully I can get through the door and then close the door to keep those zombies in there for now so I can freely check around in the corridor and get the item B there up in the top section. So let's go ahead and make an evade roll here and hope we are successful. We're looking for any arrows whatsoever to make it happen. Let's see how we do. We got it. Rebecca successfully evades, gets to complete her first action of moving into the space. She does so, and then she uses a second action to close the door behind her. Now we're going to go ahead and head down the hallway, but I'm actually going to stop right here on the corner. I am not going to use my fourth action to head into this space, as I do not want to have this corpse reanimate and come after me at the very tail end of my turn. So we're going to just move to this corner and stop right there. We now head to the reaction phase where nothing's reacting as nothing's on her tile or any linked tiles currently thanks to us closing the door. She ends up getting a green all clear card. It says dust falls from above in a thin trail accompanied by the thump of footsteps. They're on the hunt looking for you. Now let's activate Jill, who definitely has more issues present than Rebecca. She is going to go ahead and use an action. She's going to use rapid fire and we're going to shoot using three dice against a Cerberus and hopefully take it out. Let's go ahead with our three dice here. Roll and see how we do. Here's hoping to see a hit. We want to see a hit, not a graze. I want to take this thing down. Come on. No, we just ended up grazing it. I'll show you the other results that actually rolled off the camera there, but we do get a push. Now, I was about to go ahead and resolve the push. As you can see, the result I got is a push, so I can move the Cerberus into where the zombie is. I cannot move it into these back spaces because the wall stops any movement there. But the thing to note is whenever you get one of these pushes, it's not mandatory. You do not have to do it. So if you want to leave the Cerberus where it's at, you can. It's still considered a successful attack, and strategy-wise, you might want to keep it there mainly because you need to have line of sight with handguns and, of course, any kind of gun in order to make sure Shot. So if I was to push this thing around the corner, it would break my line of sight and I couldn't continue to shoot at it. So the question here is, do I want to push it? Now, regardless of whether I push it or I don't, the zombie that was not the target of this attack has heard what I've done and is going to be moving. 
So I've decided to actually go ahead and push the Cerberus down. The zombie is coming towards me because I heard the noise and I'm gonna go ahead and make another attack here. We're gonna use rapid fire again, just so you know how many bullets I have is after I do this next attack, we'll be dropping from nine down to six bullets. So we gotta be careful here because these three bullets we're spending on rapid fire every single time are draining our ammo quite quickly and I don't have any additional ammo on hand. We do have this item in our space, but I have no idea what it's gonna be yet. So let's go ahead and roll. I want to clear at least one of these enemies during this turn to make things a little easier to evade in the future. So let's hope we see one of those hit symbols on the die and we still don't get it. So here is how things change after that shot. The zombie stumbles backwards. I'm choosing to push it away, but the Cerberus can move up to two when it does a move reaction as part of not being the target of the last attack. It goes two, so it is moving at a faster pace when you're not specifically going after it. So it is much closer to me now. I'm gonna push it one more time. I really don't like this. We're gonna see if we can make another rapid fire shot here at this thing. We need to take it down. Come on, give me what I wanna see here or I'm gonna be into some serious issues. Come on, dice, be on my side for once. And nothing, but we do graze it twice. So as you can see, even if you have the ammunition, it isn't always going to be very successful to just be shooting absolutely everything. So I'm able to push the Cerberus dog back to, the zombie's gonna move forward one. I'll have one more action left to spend. I'm gonna stop shooting at this point because I only have three bullets left. I'm gonna pick up the item in my space. Well, check this out. Even though it's been painful to try and successfully thin the herds here, at least this was worth it. We got ourselves the broken shotgun. It says used in the first floor East A scenario to obtain the shotgun. That is awesome and a great find. Jill has now done all of our actions. We now move to the reaction phase. We have all of our enemies moving towards Jill. So things have gotten a little bit too close for my liking, but nothing is attacking me, which is great. And now we're gonna move into the tension phase. And the good news here is the gnawing fear card is not going to affect me as I'm not gonna be drawing additional tension cards because I managed to stay on the same tile for the entirety of my next turn here with Jill. So we're just drawing the regular one and we get ourselves an all clear. It says silence, calm, peace. Well, I don't really feel that right now with these enemies bearing down on me. Do you truly trust these things? No, I don't. Or are they sinister traps tempting you into lowering your guard? Well, at this point, we certainly shouldn't be doing that. That's gonna end off Jill's turn. So what you just saw was probably the best Resident Evil square dancing you're ever gonna see. Lots of things shuffling around, lots of bullets flying everywhere, but nothing is dead. I'm hoping here with Rebecca's activation, she can make some serious progress. She's gonna have to step through a space with a corpse, which isn't the greatest. She's gonna move into that space and we'll roll a D6. Rebecca tries to tread lightly past the corpse. Let's see if something is gonna come alive on us. No, it does not. So this corpse is going to stay put and we can continue moving. Rebecca uses all the rest of her actions to get to the back of that corridor and then picks up the item B token and finds an old key. It states here, unlocks doors locked by a simple lock. Now moving into the reaction phase, nothing is going to happen. We move on to the tension phase. Rebecca gets an all clear. It states, are the footsteps you hear at the edge of earshot another survivor or do they belong to something else entirely? Regardless, one thing is clear. If you can hear them, they can hear you too. Jill starting her turn. She absolutely does not want to mess around with the gun at this point. She just wants to try to run past these things. What's going to happen here is we'll use one action to move into the space with the two enemies. Then we'll try to do another action other than attack, which is going to force a basic attack from the highest threat enemy at us, which is going to be the Cerberus basic attack. I do get the chance to evade, of course. Jill's moved into the same space. She's gonna roll her two evasion dice and we're looking for the two better results in terms of the arrows. So the one arrow that is not gonna be beneficial for us is this one right here. We do not wanna see that one. We wanna see the other arrows, this one here or this one here. So let's hope to see one of those results on here. We can get past the enemies. We did not. So I've gone ahead and knocked Jill's hell track down another tick. We are one away from danger, which is the last on the hell track. Again, remember you don't go down until you go to a point past the danger level. So two more hits will take us to that point. We also are gonna push away the enemy that attacked us. So we're pushing the Cerberus back away from us and out of our way. We're gonna attempt to move again. This time we can take advantage of all three of the arrows when we evade. So hopefully we'll land one here and able to get past the zombie. Otherwise, the zombie's gonna has, oh my gosh, we are getting absolutely hammered. 
So Jill is currently at the danger level, which is certainly not good. She used one move action to get into the space. She's used two attempts moving to get out of this space. Failed both times, but again, they count still as actions. So she's used three actions. She's got one left. So the question is, do I stay put? Sounds like a really bad idea. And use first aid, or do I just move one and try to get further away, knowing full well that in the reaction phase, the Cerberus is going to get right back into the same space as me? Let's go with that. So we're on the move, and at this point, the reaction phase is going to kick in, so we're going to have our enemies coming after us. These enemies truly aren't letting up, and luckily, we got the all clear here. It says you pause, ears straining for even the slightest sound, nothing beyond your own ragged breathing. Well, seeing as we are running away, there certainly would be ragged breathing. So does that mean that you're safe for now? It feels like it if we're looking forwards, but if we look behind us, things aren't too good. And also a quick correction there, I didn't move everything properly based on their movement values. A zombie moves one in the reaction phase, a Cerberus moves two as I'd mentioned, so everything there is all squared away now. Moving over to Rebecca, she's going to have to walk right past the corpse again, so we're moving for two and rolling the D6. We'll go ahead and have her head down in this direction, we'll grab the D6, see how things pan out. Let's see, no Umbrella Corporation symbol, good. And we'll continue moving on around the corner here, back to the door. Rebecca gets a lucky and gets the green all clear. It says all appear safe, but you don't dare relax. In this haunted nightmare, the slightest lapse of concentration can lead to an untimely demise. Now, speaking of an untimely demise, let's go ahead with Jill's turn and hope for the best here. There's a couple ways I could go with this, but I'm going to be a little bit risky. And by a little bit, I mean a lot. I'm not going to push to heal. I'm going to just strictly attempt to evade this thing and get some separation. We'll try and heal a bit further down, but this is getting tight. So let's go ahead and make that evasion roll. We're just evading one small base character. So we get three dice and we're looking for any of the arrows to save us. So we've got 50% chances across all the dice. So I'm feeling somewhat decent. Let's see how we do. Oh, sorry, my mistake. We only get two dice here, of course, with Jill when we're rolling this. So let's see how we do. Uh, come on. Yes. Thank goodness. So with Jill's very first action, she's able to move into the space, evading the service. We need to put some distance between us. Let's move again, and we're rolling a D6 to see whether the corpse is going to be coming alive on us, which we certainly don't want to see. So here's hoping we do not see that symbol. We don't. We are A-OK. -okay. Let's continue to move. I'm feeling just a tad bit better about this situation now. She is as far away as she needs to be to avoid getting beat up pretty badly. So hopefully we're okay. Of course, I have no idea what the tension deck might throw at us, but at this point, we're just doing our reaction phase. The Cerberus moving two every single time is no help to me, so it is making some decent progress every single time. I really need to get through that door and close it, and then hopefully then I can use some type of first aid or something like that to take a breath for a second and heal up. Here's hoping that can happen. We're done the reaction phase. Let's find out what the tension phase has for us. This all clear card says, low growls torment you. Well, absolutely with this thing behind me. Sinister whispers that bleed from behind closed doors and through thin walls. In this hellish place, little respite is offered. Only moments to catch your breath for as long as you dare. This literally couldn't be more thematic in this situation. Now we head over to Rebecca. She's in much better shape. She's going to go ahead and use two move actions to get to the door. She'll be right here. Then use one more move action to get through the doorway. The second we do this, we reference the scenario book. It'll tell us the number that associates itself with this door, which is one in this case. We go to the campaign dashboard, those cards in the bottom right hand corner for exploration. We find the one that has a one on it, and that is the card that's going to tell us how to populate what's going on the right hand side as we go through the door. So when you reveal that exploration card, you're going to see the scenario name and the number that matches with the door that you've gone through. Next, you're going to go ahead and look for the S's, and you're going to match these S's up to the scenario. It might mean you need to turn the card and orientate it properly. So in this case, if we turn it like this. That doesn't look right, I don't believe. Yeah, actually, no, that is right. The sword key is heading south this way. This one's leading in this way, and then it connects over here. So this is exactly the orientation we need to create in order to bring this place together. And just like that, a whole new section of the mansion has been revealed and it connects all the way around to the opposite side where Jill is. So there is a way for these two individuals to connect now. Of course, if we actually get the sword key, we can connect ourselves to this door, but these ones don't require keys at all. So that's good news. Now, the other doors you can see, this one will lead to number two exploration card. So this doesn't have a lock on it. So I could go through here and find out what's inside. The second also that Rebecca walks onto this tileless corridor right here, she's going to have to go 
go ahead and deal with an encounter card here. So we're going to pull that up in a moment. We'll continue on down. We've got door over here, more encounter cards in here. We have a wall, which I had to place because this terrain tile did not have a wall on it. We already used the one with the wall down below here. Uh, we have an item B token we can pick up in here. This right here is a locked, simple lock door. So remember that old key that Rebecca just picked up? It's in her inventory. This key will open up that door. I cannot for the life of me find anything that has a card like this that states um, simple lock. So we're just going to note the fact that this is a simple lock door. These other ones, as I mentioned before, are not locked. We can just traverse right through them. There is an item A inside and one encounter card pull. So that is everything connected. And we have one more action with Rebecca. But first, let's deal with this encounter card. And wouldn't you know it, the second that we walk in that corridor, a zombie is spawned. As it states here, the closest spawn point being one away from us. We have one more action, and I think I'm going to go ahead and actually shoot this thing. Now, let's just take a look around here. Now, all the doors are closed, leading to other enemies, so it won't affect anybody else. Let's go ahead and try and make this shot and down this zombie. We are using rapid fire, so we're down to six ammo now after spending three. Let's see if we get what we need to take it out. Come on, yes, we do indeed. It turns into a corpse. Now I'm gonna strategically resolve the dice effects that I have, which is a push and a hit for one damage. I'm gonna do the push first to actually bump the zombie away from the door I'd like to check out very soon. And then the hit that actually does damage is gonna take the zombie down. So a great turn overall for Rebecca. She was able to get into a new area. She was able to take down a zombie. Very, very efficient. She's doing great. Jill, on the other hand, needs to step her game up a little bit. We're done here at this point, and thankfully, nothing will react during the reaction phase because nothing on her tile, that is Rebecca's, or any linked open door or open archway tiles have any enemies on it, so nothing's reacting. We head right to the tension phase. And it's an all clear, and it states fatigue burns hard, your muscles complaining as much as your frayed nerves on this long night of sustained horror. But for a moment at least, you found respite. Pause to calm your nerves and consider your next move. And you know what? Based on what happened over there with Rebecca, I'm changing my entire approach to what I'm doing with Jill. It makes absolutely no sense for her to open up this door, head in here to go after an item A, have to deal with an encounter card, get stuck in an area where she needs a sword key that she currently doesn't have, and then of course have all these enemies chasing her and of course being blocked by the door. But she'd be jammed up in this area for quite some time and not very useful. So instead what we're going to do is we're actually going to make a break for it and head back this way and I can actually go one, two, two, three, and we're going to shut the door to make sure no enemies are coming after us. So Jill runs for the door and closes it behind her, safely keeping the enemies at bay. That's the end of her turn. Reaction phase comes. Nothing is connected to her tile or on her tile currently that's going to activate. We move on to the tension card. But we all know Resident Evil and evil never sleeps. We have Vigor Mortis that says your enemies lunge forward unpredictably, nails clawing through the air as their teeth snap with bestial hunger. Enemies on the same tile as the active character immediately perform a reaction. If there's no enemies on the active character's tile, draw two tension cards instead. This is not going to trigger also at the bottom. This is a nasty card. It's actually a great time to get it in this situation. Thank goodness I dived into that room. Wow, that could have been really bad if I wasn't able to get through there and close the door. I would have done that, but think if that had have actually activated some enemies in the room, that would have been really bad for Jill. Now we're still not completely in the clear yet because we have to draw two cards. This one says, in times to come, this evening will define you, how you overcome your challenges, how you defeated your enemies, how you triumphed and solved the mystery. Don't let this beat you. You must survive. And in the end, things calmed down. Thankfully, that red card did not hurt us. We got two greens back to back. It says, low growls torment you. Sinister whispers that bleed behind closed doors. Very thematic. And through the thin walls in this hellish place, little respite is offered. Only moments to catch your breath as far or as long as you dare, I should say. This has been really, really fun to this point. I feel like we're at a great spot right now to end part number one. Here's a bird's eye view of the scenario to date. Wow, what a close, close call for Jill so far in this video. And going into the next one, her priority on her activation is absolutely going to be to heal herself up because she is on the danger level for health. She's getting absolutely hammered down in the south portion of the mansion, whereas Rebecca is just breezing through. Now, I'm sure that's going to probably change. We still have other rooms with other encounter cards. We have tension deck cards that are coming out and throwing things into the weeds. But things are good for us. We have the old key. We also have the broken shotgun. 
done. So we are making progress and hopefully we can come out of this thing alive. So thank you guys so much for watching to this point. Let me know in the comments below whether you're enjoying this. And also if you want, throw some strategy tips in there or other options as to what I can try and accomplish on my upcoming turns in the next video. Thank you guys so much for watching. And as always, keep on rolling solo.